Kelda Martinson, I'm the faculty chair of the art department. Hello, I'm so happy that you could all be here today. Um, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement for the space that we're in. On behalf of North Seattle College, we acknowledge that we occupy the traditional ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish, a people that are still here continuing to honor and bring light to their ancient heritage. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue, and learning space. We ask that we take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. It is now my pleasure to welcome the artist, composer, farmer, and friend, <laughs> Nat Evans. I have been fortunate to know Nat for several years now. His love of and fluency in the dialogue of art, food, earth, music, animals, and the natural world has always made an impression on me. Nat has an expansive mind and heart, and we are honored to invite him to speak with us today as part of the programming for our current gallery exhibition, Implications of a Simple Landscape, held in the North Seattle College Art Gallery. And I hope you all will ha um, take a few moments to see that show if you have not already. I want to thank the Art Gallery for their support in inviting Nat to speak today. Nat Evans is a composer and artist based in Seattle, Washington. His interdisciplinary works range from site-specific events and installations to chamber music, scores for dance and film, conceptual works based in ecology and social practice, to meditations on everyday life. As a farmer, Nat runs Quiet Land Urban Farm, which provides vegetables on a weekly basis to subscribers. His work is regularly presented across the United States as well as internationally. Evans has received numerous commissions, including the Henry Art Gallery, Odeon Quartet, San Francisco MoMA, Seattle Art Museum, the City of Tomorrow, Portland Cello Project, All Rise, and the Indianapolis Museum of Art, among others. Works and events by Evans have been featured on WNYC's New Sounds and the BBC, as well as in LA Weekly, Wired, the New York Times, Vice, Tiny Mixtapes, The Believer, and numerous other publications. His work has appeared at galleries such as Interstitial, Soil, the Fry Art Museum, Greg Cusera, as well as Mediate Art, Soundwave Biennial, Aqua Art Miami, Nepo 5K, and other festivals. He studied music at Butler University. Please join me in welcoming Nat Evans. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, I, uh, landscape is uh, really important and integral to my practice uh, as an artist and composer and also as a farmer. And it's all uh, looped together for me through my uh, longtime practice in, um, in Zen Buddhism. And uh, through that, I kind of see uh, landscape in my work uh, as something that starts internally, so the internal landscape that then flows out through to the external landscape. And that there's a, a constant flow always between those two, between those two things that our, um, you know, our consciousness extends out of us through our, through our multiple senses, kind of like this layer of paint that then uh, is, sort of coats everything that we are viewing. And then in doing that, then that uh, reflects back into us. So we're always, um, through our actions and through our minds, we're always creating the landscape. And then the landscape is also always continuing reshaping us. So it's this vast interconnectedness that we are always uh, in dialogue with, whether we realize it or not, through all of our actions. Um, and the kind of axial point of uh, farming Zen and everything is uh, lineage and death. Some of it is lineage uh, in Zen simply because the practice of Zen is uh, one that you can trace your lineage uh, all the way back to the time of the Buddha, so 2,500 years of uh, simply mind-to-mind -mind transmission. Uh, it's lineage for me as a farmer because um, my family has been here doing farming of uh, one sort or another uh, since 1710 for 12 generations. Um, but uh, through death, we kind of have this line lineage beyond comprehension 
that uh, is what allows us to exist. That, you know, say the, the soil that we all walk on or that our food grows in is, you know, is just a bunch of dead bodies of, uh, of plants and animals that once were that then got eaten by other plants and animals. And we just sort of walk along on that. Or, you know, if you're walking, uh, you know, walking around on some rocks and it's just a bunch of crushed up dead bodies. But, you know, it's all sort of way beyond our, our comprehension. And that's what allows us to live and be here uh, in this very moment. So uh, to start with Zen, is uh, is appropriate, I think, because in Zen we actually uh, wear a landscape. So this is called a this is a robe that we wear when we're meditating called a rakasu, and uh, it is an abstraction of rice paddies. Um, so 2,500 years ago, when the Buddha was wandering around, um, there were lots of other people who were hanging around in the wilderness who were, you know, looking for the meaning of life and everything else, and um, not, you know, not unlike Jesus with lots of radical Jews also cruising around. So anyway, uh, some people wanted to support Buddhist followers and so they asked him, you know, how can we know that someone is a, a follower of you, Buddha? So they were up on a hillside and they looked down and they saw all these uh, rice paddies there. And so he said, I'm gonna have everybody sew these robes that look like rice paddies. So if you see one, you know, you'll know it's us. So, um, so that's the significance of this shape. And then you'll see up at the top, there's a little green stitch, which is a pine needle stitch. And um, when, we, uh, when we put our robes on, then we touch the pine needle stitch to our heads. Which, so it's kind of like you put this landscape on and you're embodying Buddha's teachings. And at the same time, by uh, touching that to your forehead, you're, you're internalizing the landscape um, into yourself too. Um, everything uh, in Zen sort of flows through the landscape. Traditional um, monasteries were set up in China and then in Japan through sort of this Taoist concept of flowing through the landscape. So setting up uh, the different, different buildings that make up a, a grounds to flow within the forest that they were within. And there was also usually um, a farm so that they were, you know, sort of self-sufficient. Um, and that came about starting in about the 800s or so in China, and then moved on to Japan. Um, but in that, you know, flowing between spaces and in farming uh, and in working is that the ethos in Zen is that everything is a possibility for meditation. Every, every poss everything is a possibility for realizing our interconnectedness in the moment. So, um, my teacher, when I, when I made the Rakasu, then he gave me a Dharma name, which is uh, Jion, which means the sound of compassion. So I took that as a serious cue that I need to imbue my work with all of that. So uh, in uh, 2010, I, I made these things called headphone, I started making these events called headphone listening events, um, which were things where people simply came and listened and observed something. In this case, sunrise or sunset. So I made a piece of uh, sort of a sound collage of field recordings, so just recordings of different ambient sounds I thought were interesting. And I wrote music and put them all together into this like 25 minute track that traced the changing of light at particular times of day. And people would come and meet at this particular time and then we would all press play together and observe, observe light changing. <coughs> so it's very much um, simply a meditation on landscape and an opportunity like in a meditation group setting to be, to be alone together. Um, and I ended up taking this piece kind of all over the country. I toured all over the country that summer. Um, this is in Brooklyn. And then it was presented at different festivals and stuff. And I kind of started um, realizing that, not really intentionally, but it sort of was like a, um, like a fluxus work and that the simpler instructions were to come to this place and watch the light together and listen, you know, or, which, or like a, a Yoko Ono piece watch the sun until it becomes a square. So it's that just a simple instruction that you can do together with other people. Um, 
So I did I did a couple of those pieces, and then I began to do um, one at the Hart School in Connecticut, and I got commissioned by the Sound Biennial, which is a sound art biennial in, that happens in San Francisco, to do one for um, the Changing Tide in uh, 2014. So uh, this one was uh, similar, but not as much about light. It was more about observing uh, water moving back. And everywhere, every time I did one of these pieces, um, people would comment about things that occurred while they were just sitting. Um, like at the one in, um, oh, this is in San Francisco on Ocean Beach, you know, all these, I don't actually know what these creatures are, but they float around on the top of the water and they have this little sail and they all got blown en masse up onto the beach while we <laughs> were watching the tide go out. Um, but that's kind of the, uh, I felt that's kind of, that, that's what kind of what meditation is all about is that, you know, there's these things that are going on in the world all the time, but we, you know, it's up to us to be able to wake up to the moment, to be able to understand or just realize that they're happening there. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, as I as I continued doing more things, I eventually I used a lot of field recordings in um, pieces and. Uh, but they didn't have necessarily have a strong meaning attached to them. So, and uh, because of other, I don't know, you know, life factors is one is aging, you itch to do other things. So I decided I'm gonna go for a really long walk and start making a lot of uh, field recordings. So in 2014, I decided to hike the Pacific Crest Trail in a project called The Tortoise. And for this, uh, I the impetus was that I was gonna make field recordings all along the way. It's a trail that runs from Mexico to Canada. It's 2,600 miles long, and it goes through California, Oregon, and Washington. And um, I, so I, I made field recordings, and then I would send the SD card through the mail to people, and uh, different composers who received these SD cards would then take those and make a sound collage and write some music and post it online so that people could hear how the sound of the trail changed as they moved northward um, all summer long. So I was out there for five months um, just hiking. Uh, again, it was very much uh, a kind of a, a reflection of my practice in Buddhism. There's lot, there are lots of um, examples of walking in um, Tibet. There's Mount Kailash, which is um, a mountain that Tibetans will um, go and they will prostrate their way around the entire mountain. Or in Japan, there are certain trails with shrines that you go along and visit. Uh, it was, you know, a lot of times field recordings, people think of them as like, we're trying to capture this nature sound, but I really view them and practice it on the trail as just being objective, that you are simply listening to whatever it is there, whether it's power lines or windmills or, or whatever. Um, and it also kind of became like a, it became a, a, a meditation as well, um, on death at times because you know it's you're really exposed to the elements and your body uh, changes as a result of just being outside all the time and constantly moving like 20 miles a day so you can start to think about your body and how fragile it is <laughs> uh, so I was out there writing music that was ostensibly why I was there but I kind of I was also out there to do other things. I'm not sure what the, I didn't know what those things were, but I just wanted to move beyond where I had been as an artist up to that point. So I wrote my own music and did end up putting it out with um, all the other composers. But as I went along, then I started encountering these particular places that were they seemed really holy. They were like um, kind of ecstatic spaces for listening. So this this is a um, foxtail pine, and there are these groves up in the high Sierras. So you know you're like 
on the edge of tree line up there and something inside of you changes but it's it's uh, yeah, it's, it's just different. Your listening is totally different. You're not bombarded with all the, the sounds of everyday life that you encounter in the city. So I started paying attention to those kind of like particular sacred seeming places that I passed through. And the trail itself also kind of became like a kind of a metaphor for, uh, for existence. I, you know, I remember the day when you started at the Mexican border walking north, but really, um, after a while, then it just sort of becomes like the trail has always been and it always will be, even though supposedly you're going to an end point. Just is, you're just flowing along like that's the luminous plane of, of existence, that's it. Um, and after a while, um, when you don't have so many of the kind of senses or sensory bombardment that we have all the time in the city, then it kind of, you sort of start to sense the landscape in a different kind of way. Um, I think, like, I was trying to think of like a, a metaphor for it. Like, I, there was this dog in my neighborhood when I was growing up, and he was blind. But he just cruised around as though there was no problem because, I mean, of course, dogs can smell really well, so it's like they're just sort of sensing their way around. But it seems miraculous to us because we can't do that. Um, but it's that same kind of like weird sensing sort of becomes a part of what happens when you're on this durational event when all you're doing is moving continuously through, this land, through the landscape. So when I got back, I, you know, I released a record, but then I also just kind of wanted to get back to basics. So drawing is a big part of what I do. And uh, so I was just started making ink drawings of the sh shadows of, uh, or um, silhouettes of different natural objects. And, you know, that seemed, for whatever reason, it seemed like the best way to represent my experience on the trail, even though these natural objects are in my neighborhood, not while I'm wandering around in the wilderness. Um, but I, and I had all these field recordings, you know, I had hundreds of field recordings that I'd made out there. And I thought, you know, I would really just like to hang out and play field recordings for people and have tea and we can just talk and that would be the best way to present this work. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I made this, this piece that is equally as ephemeral. So, you know, I would draw all these natural objects, their silhouettes, and set up an installation for people to come and just listen and, and have tea with me and talk about these experiences. And it extended out to, um, I made, I started making installations with drawings so that it was more like one big sound collage, like a 45 minute listening event where people would just come and be in space. So kind of like my experience of the wilderness sort of reflected into and interpreted through a new space that people are experiencing it through. Uh, and eventually the the kind of, you know, I was wandering for a long time, but rootedness <laughs> is ultimately what what I am about as a, as a person and community. And so uh, I really like to cook and I like to garden and um, create immersive events for people. So the, the obvious direction for me was to have, um, kind of going off of the tea, was to do these uh, sound dinner events. So uh, I, have, I would just host them at my house. I would, people would pay money to come and have dinner. Um, it would be, there would be field recordings that were playing in the space when people came, um, you know, seasonal decorations on the table. All the food um, was related to my experience with um, Zen temple food from living in China or from going to retreats. Um, and then I grew uh, as many of the vegetables as I could in my garden. Um, and, and then in between the courses, there would be performances that would occur. So it might be like, I'm gonna give you a prompt and we're gonna all talk about sound and then we're gonna have soup silently together. And then there's gonna be someone who's gonna play this short piece on saxophone that occurs for 10 minutes that watch, that, um, 
has something to do with some seasonal event, and then we're going to have the next course. I'll let you talk, and then something, you know. So it's sort of, sort of choreographed, but also kind of like a, a dinner party too. But the sort of structure of it all um, also is sort of a reflection of is a reflection of my practice in Zen. Um, uh, Dogen, who established Soto Zen in Japan, wrote the, this text called "Instructions for the Tenzo." where again in Zen everything is a possibility for meditation and including cooking. So I studied that a lot when I was um, working on all this, this series of sound dinners which kind of happened throughout the year in 2017 I think it was. Uh, and it's influenced also by uh, formalized um, a ritual style of eating called Oryoki style. In, uh, in Japanese Zen, which is what I practice. So this is an Oriyoki set and all the bowls nest inside of one another. The, the biggest bowl represents Buddha's head. Um, so you're like eating out of Buddha's skull. You're eating the medicine of, of Buddhism when you're eating out of it and you carry it around in a particular way so as you're so to be very careful with it. Um, yeah, so I, you know, we're kind of creeping towards farming of <laughs> growing vegetables, social practice, interactions with people. That's what sound dinners kind of led, that's where they started leading. Along with landscape, uh, you know, the all the plants, there's also the animals are a big part of the landscape. So you know, I made this, I did a piece called Coyote Ways, which was, um, uh, an album of music, but it was also some writing and some performative lectures that I gave. So I st spent time kind of cataloging all these experiences that I've had with coyotes over the years, um, and especially on the Pacific Crest Trail when I was out there hiking, um, they were like, they were all over the place. They kind of felt like some weird friend that was following me around collectively. Um, but I, I, so I studied indigenous trickster tales and trickster tales in general, and then the history of coyotes in America and kind of cross-referenced them in a performative lecture and performed the music. I'll, uh, I'll play some of the music. So uh, I went on tour uh, that, was, that was in 2017 too, I guess. Um, so I went. I was on tour. I did the. I did like sound bath events. I did these um, performative lectures. And then I was visiting my grandfather that year, and he's a a farmer, also. And he, so I was like, I remember some pictures of you. He was born in 1928, so these are old pictures. I was like, I remember some pictures of you when you were on the farm growing up in, in uh, southern Illinois. And he said, yeah, you know, uh, they're up in this such and such room in my house. You should go. I think you can find them. And so I got them out, and uh, there, were, there were hundreds of pictures in there. And tin types going back to the 1860s of our family. And... Um, Pictures from the farm when he was a kid in the 20s and 30s in Southern Illinois and earlier. Um, and all, all, seemingly almost everybody in our family from that era, like 1860 to 1940 or so. And he said, you know, Nat, I realize you and I are the only people in our family who are alive who have seen any of these photos. Um, which was like a crazy revelation to me. So. Uh, there, there's a, a, we have a really clear family tree for the last um, 350 years of our family and then all these photos were labeled on the back and so we knew who everybody was and it was just incredible so I started sharing it with my family but at the same time as I, um, as I was researching about my family and where these people were, they started out in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, I realized that um, this was very much part of the history and the arc of America because uh, as they moved west generation after generation, it was very much in sync with uh, genocide of indigenous groups that occurred at the same time in those, in those places and the kind of, um, the uh, sort of colonialist methodology for it all was that um, uh, oftentimes citizens were recruited into 
Gupta's and then would go out and, you know, have these waves of destruction with the help of the federal government. And then white settlers would be encouraged to move in. And that happened, you know, successively, successively over generations as, as we went west. So I was, you know, it was kind of, a, it was a real wake up call, like, oh, okay. <laughs> We're, you know, we all know as, as, as if you're a white person in this country, you're, you have that part of your history, but feeling it very tangibly was powerful to me. But not just the indigenous people, the change of ecology too. Um, most of my family, most of them ended up the, in the, the middle part of the country, which is sort of derogatorily referred to as flyover country. Um, and so like this person was in um, Deadwood, South Dakota, which is all prairie. My grand grandfather grew up in um, tall grass prairie in southern Illinois. And other people went down to short grass prairie down in the most northeastern corner of New Mexico. And all this whole area was uh, teeming with life. Uh, there was, you know, tens of millions of bison, antelope, grizzly bears, elk, bighorn sheep, wolves. It was really rich. Um, but the reason that we think of it as being is totally dead now is because, you know, we killed everything. In the 19th century, it was just a total bloodbath and we killed it all. <laughs> So I started researching, this is my cousin Vikash, we, there's, um, there's some little nuggets of, um, of prairie that still exists out there. So I started doing some research and eventually it led to uh, this piece called uh, Flyover Country, which was an evening length performance. So it encapsulated kind of everything, history of farming, my family, um, archival images, video, drawing, uh, music. I performed along with uh, Will Hayes, who plays guitar, um, and then spoken to. So it's a performative lecture event. So I thought um, right now I would do a little uh, excerpt from Flyover Country to kind of give you a little taste. If you're lucky enough to be in a tall grass prairie, one of the little nuggets of the 4% that remain on the southern plains, it's oceanic. The biodiversity is unbelievably rich, and the landscape just swallows you up like an ocean. It feels like the luminous continuity of life itself. You can sense its boundaries on the one hand, and on the other, you're unable to comprehend a beginning or end. And I was out there walking in the tall grass prairie of the Flint Hills of Kansas, thinking about how Western culture hides death from itself. The food we eat, our own inevitable death, suffering of others, the strain on the land. And we project all of our fears onto death, thus ignoring it, further perpetuating the myth of ourselves existing outside the vast interconnectedness of reality. And from there, making decisions as though there are no consequences. And I was sitting in my living room recently, and it was all dark except for this moonlight pouring in, cool on my face, glowing on the floor, thinking about these walks in the tall grass prairie of Kansas. And I'd driven across Kansas many times, but I always felt it was just so boring, so dead, because it really is, mostly. But in the Flint Hills of the prairie, I've never felt so alive. And that moonlight seems to emanate and be reflected back out of the earth there. Have you ever been sitting on the edge of a lake or a pond and seen the moon reflected in it? Or walking in some ropey, long, tumbling grasses covered in dew and look down to see all these little moons reflected in the dew drops, shimmering little moon jewels? Or walking across a field of obsidian way up above tree line and broken images of the moon glimmer in the volcanic glass. There are huge, almost perfectly round bear patches, bison wallows out on the prairie, moon shapes that reflect a particular energy back out into the ecosystem. 
usually starts as a sort of a depression emanating from deep underground where the Ogallala aquifer pulls at the soil. And bison will come and rub off some of their fur when they're molting, cover themselves with mud to protect from insects, itch themselves, or maybe just have fun too. And in time as the ground grows bare and the depression a little deeper, different types of plants are able to grow surrounding the wallow that wouldn't be able to otherwise. After a rain, birds and mammals come drink from the pools of water, and if the wallow, wallow is deep enough and the rains come, frogs may spawn there, the pools harboring tadpoles. Moon, the one that waxes and wanes, and buffalo wallow, these vessels of reflection. So that's a little excerpt from Flyover Country, evening length work. Uh, so, you know, all this work uh, and thinking about farming uh, on Flyover Country and my own experience growing up with my own family, uh, you know, I kind of, I've, I, I kind of realized, like, I need to become a farmer. Uh, <laughs> it's time. So, uh, so I, in 2018, I started Quiet Land Urban Farm. Um, urban because I live in Seattle and I can't go to the country right now. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, farming uh, is a big part of the landscape in America and American cities. Previously, before World War II, there were lots of market gardens. Um, instead of suburbia, there were people who would uh, provide cities directly with vegetables. So like, um, there might be Joe. Joe grows all the cucumbers, and there's somebody else, and they have tons of chickens, and they have eggs, you know. And so your produce and other um, stuff was, you know, was like right there. Um, and then as suburbia came in and, industri and agriculture became much more industrialized in America, then food became more anonymous and more removed from cities and everyday life. So urban farming really, in a way, is actually kind of a re return to the way that food used to be in America. So I started asking around, uh, you know, I was like, uh, just asking people like, can I farm your land? There are, you know, and um, surprisingly, uh, People said yes, so uh, yeah. So so I started finding finding some places, and I have about an eighth of an acre collectively, um, which is so tiny when you think of it. I mean, there's 20 million acres of grass in in America, just of grass. So you know, we could be making we could be growing a lot of food for ourselves within the cities if we wanted to. Anyway, so I found some land, and um, you know, a lot of my work has to do with social practice and interacting with people, and so I've kind of found that farming has become that, and it's also a reflection of the landscape because, um, you know, you when you're a farmer, uh, you know, you should be a steward of the land. You're a steward of that landscape, and it starts from how it is that you grow your seeds to what it is that you're um, growing in the garden, uh, you have to, you're responsible to, to all of it. Um, but it also becomes a really uh, meditative thing, just like uh, farms on, in uh, monastic settings in Zen. Um, you know, I take it as an opportunity for meditation, too. Um, similarly, also to uh, Zen, there are, um, in ancient China, they, instead of observing like four seasons, or 24, they call the 24 solar terms, so 24 micro seasons, and 
When you're farming, you're much more in touch with that is, you know, that, that that is the reality of weather, that it is not for big chunks of time. It is always changing, that the nature of weather is simply change. And so you have to kind of, you know, hop up on the surfboard or you're going to get washed under. Um, so whether you, I like it, whether, you, whether one likes it or not as a farmer, um, I take it as a great opportunity to observe and be with the weather and create the landscape. Uh, it's also kind of like, you know, like an earthwork. Uh, and for me, uh, well, in Zen, we take this uh, sort of an unfulfillable vow to save all beings. And so I take that as a mandate to look after the, the soil in that way. And the soil is kind of like uh, an extension of the landscape, but we can't see it. So much stuff that's going on underneath it. So uh, our farm is no till or no dig, meaning that we do not till the soil. So instead of turning it all, everything over to suppress weeds in the spring and prepare the ground for planting, it's actually not necessary. So um, we feed the soil with compost and through other methods and cover crops. And then um, uh, that way we're feeding fungi that, that permeate the landscape, um, all the worms, arthropods, bacteria, everything. The ecosystem of the soil is perhaps the most important part of your farm. And so by doing no-till, we're hoping to uh, create a better place for all those beings that allow us to live by growing where we grow all this food. Um, yeah. So, but I, so I, you know, I, I'm, of course, I'm still an artist and Farming, uh, in a way, just feels kind of like, it, it could be like anything that you do in your life. I mean, your life is a, your life is a performance uh, that you can engage with if you want to. Um, I prefer to do it that way. So it's, you know, it's like this ongoing performance piece that just kind of stretches out uh, continually for me. Um, and it has everything, all those sort of things of sound, of listening to place, of walking, interacting with people. It's as all those sort of elements of all these works that I've, uh, that led me to eventually come add farming into my practice um, as an artist. So, uh, yeah. And so now uh, I, I feel so lucky to be able to grow food in the city and um, use it in my, use all these plant, this plant matter in my uh, art practice and yeah, so I feel, I feel, I feel so blessed as an artist and as a farmer. So that's all I've got. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nat. Would you be willing to take some questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. Great. So we do have um, about fifteen minutes where we can. Uh, hopefully stay and, and let Matt know if there are questions are. And, um, anyone can take the floor. Let me make sure I can see your hands. I have a question. When you, uh, where people were listening to the, the sounds and watching the sunset, did you change that for where they were going to be, like the East Coast versus the West Coast? Did that evolve, or was it kind of a, a static? The sound was static, but the but it was all uh, it was based on time. So it might be a really weird time, like uh, and like location and season too. So yeah, whenever when I would tell people to meet, it, like the the pieces, you know, they would start. Um, I think I think it was like 15 minutes before whatever its sunset time was. So people would arrive like a few minutes before that. I would we would press play and listen. Sunset occurs, then it extends another five minutes. So whatever I would adjust that to whatever time sunset was that day that the event was being held. Yeah. It's kind of universal, like no matter where you were, you would have this the experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to your art practice and farming, have you experienced any like frustration in the process or? Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, in, um, in both, in everything. Uh, I mean, I don't view Zen as being a calming activity. It's more just a realization of whatever is happening, whether I'm pissed off because, like, these crops are failing or um, some performer is late to rehearsal or whatever. If I'm awake to that moment, that's just, that's just, that's just the moment, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, um, you mentioned, I think, that you lived in China at some point. And I'm, I'm curious about how um, your practice as an artist evolved over time with your Zen practice. So um, you've been there, I guess, when that started and you became aware of it. Uh, well, I'd been a Zen Buddhist for a long, for, you know, maybe 10 years or so, and then I, when I, um, took the precepts and, um, received my, uh, Dharma name from my teacher, then, I don't know, when was that? 2011, maybe? I don't remember. Uh, you know, so at any rate, uh, I, I think I made the sunset and sunrise pieces before, but I was already interested in integrating meditation in a way. But after 20, I think it was 2012 when I took the precepts um, and sewed the rakasu that I showed at the beginning, uh, that's when uh, I really felt like I had a, uh, a mandate from my teacher that I needed to try uh, as best I could to create uh, events and things that were had some kind of compassion wrapped up in them. Yeah. And I, I lived in China in um, uh, 2002, I think it was. I, I, I ran away and taught English there and hung out for a while. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you feel more secure in your work after practicing then? Or do you ever feel like it's more Just like as an artist in general? Um, I think that uh, the, possi the possibility for um, the, the potential in Zen is that you can, it's not, not like it makes you a better person, it just makes you more you, or you realize more of who you are as a person, for better or worse. And so I, so I, I feel more secure as a person as a result, and I think therefore as as an artist for sure. But I don't know; they're kind of interlinked. But also, as I've just kind of, uh, I've been very fortunate uh, of, with people supporting my work over the years. So there's also just I feel like a certain amount of luck of people just being very kind and supporting my work that creates a perhaps false sense of security, but I just keep making it anyway. <laughs> uh, can you talk a little bit about the platform for and urban and how vegetables get to people? Oh, yeah. Uh, so it is a, uh, I have a CSA, which stands for Community Supported Agriculture. So people pay me money at the beginning of the season which helps with a lot of the upfront costs. And then I deliver them on a weekly basis from um, May through, to, uh, through October to people. Yeah. Yeah. On several points during uh, your talk, I kept thinking about cycles and cyclicity in both in the farming and sunrise and sunset and numerous places throughout. I was curious whether you see your life practice as opposed to the self-life practice in some way is having uh, any elements of cyclicity and whether you or as you look forward whether there are whether you're hopeful to return to some things that you've done in the past and you know with in, in like in different ways or, or whether that's a concern at all or not um well I kind of feel like uh, a lot of my work is just one big work that I, you know, it's like, yes, I have these ideas, but they are just kind of, I always feel like they're just sort of this one big circle that I'm just, you know, I'm just got this big pot of soup and sometimes there's a new ingredient that plops in and I serve it to people, but um, it's all kind of feels the same to me, if that makes sense, you know? Like it's kind of, kind of one continuous thing, yeah. 
Does that answer your question? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. With your uh, family history research, I wonder if you um, envision any, if you're working off of purely images or if there's some story collecting happening there. Oh, well. yeah. Well, when we, uh, when we went and digitized all the images, then I also interviewed my grandfather. Yeah. And, and, uh, and my dad has a lot of stories, too, that we recorded, too. Um, but most of that is kind of in a very specific time, just like the family in uh, southern Illinois from, like, you know, 19 like the early teens up through when my grandfather left so in the 40s so we have a lot of stories from that era that we that we collected for sure yeah yeah and i've done a little bit of uh research by going to my family's homestead in new mexico um where they were kicked out by the dust bowl and talked to some of the the handful of people that still live there. It was a town of a few thousand people when my family lived there. There's six people that live there now. I've met four of them. Um, <laughs> and um, so they had some things to say as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and quiet, I forgot, quiet land uh, for the farm is the, the my, my first ancestors in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, who were the first generation of farming here, uh, they were Mennonites, and the, the ethos of the Mennonites is to be the quiet in the land. So the name is kind of a nod to, to them as well. So lineage part, uh, like in the Zen practice, this is like really the uh, Dharma law, you know, it's everything is about the lineage and very important, like transferring the knowledge. And uh, about the farming, I guess, in your ancestors, there's a lineage of like, practices continued on, and that is really parallel. Um, but you mentioned something about the, uh, like your current practice seems to be nurturing the uh, land, instead of like taking, like, resource and everything out of, you know, so it's like very op opposite in a way. And do you think, um, as a practice, you know, farming, but um, the attitude and uh, how you approach it is kind of like not reverse, but you know, it's really shifted. Do you think that lineage is, um, I wouldn't say broken, but it's really shifted from your, you know, generation? Oh, like my, shifted from my generation of like my family's lineage of farming? Right. Yeah, well, um, f well first, first of all, you're definitely right, there's a lineage um, in, uh, in America, or maybe the world at large, I don't know, but they, they refer to that kind of passing on of knowledge in farming as generational continuity, and that that is like a really important aspect of uh, trying to save uh, farming in America because it so often becomes impossible for people to continue to farm. So that lineage is really important. But, um, you know, on the one hand, like every, every generation like, like that is still alive, farming and agriculture has meant something really different. So, you know, my grandfather, when he grew up on a farm, it was, um, you know, a a diverse, what's called a diverse operation. So there's like chicken. It's more like what you think of as an American farm. There's chickens, there's cows. We're growing some corn over here. There's a vegetable garden, you know, very self-sustaining and we're gonna uh, slaughter our neighbor's hog and use the lard for all of our uh, lipids. But, uh, you know, that doesn't, that's not how most farms are now. Um, you know, and then my dad, um, he worked in like super, he's a botanist. But then he also worked in like industrial, the genetics of corn. So, I mean, honestly, kind of the enemy. <laughs> and, um, but he's also an orchardist. He has an apple orchard and um, grows apples and sells them and cider and stuff. Um, but collectively, you know, it's all about, um, oh, well, I certainly go back, going back to my grandfather, he has a market garden that he sold, he sold at the farmer's market in his uh, town for like 30 years. Um, he has like two acres. 
So in a way, it's kind of like a return to what he was. He does sell. He doesn't sell there anymore, but. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a collection, but I mean, all this information about plants and growing stuff, like I grew up, you know, with all of that, like all the time. Um, so it's really a part of me even before I started farming and it's kind of how I view the world. Um, but uh, now I just have to adapt it to where I am. Yeah. Nice. Um, the urban farming aspect of your work is really fascinating to me, and the fact that you sort of see that as a, a bit of performance art almost, um, I, I love that. And Thank you. I was wondering if I wanted to find out more about the CSA and your efforts in possibly acquiring land and how you farm it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, I had, it, there's an Instagram and Facebook accounts. So if you just look up Quiet Land Urban Farm, you can find find me on there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Did you want to say I, I've been to Emporia, Kansas twice for workshops, and I would drive past Flint Hills Technical College. That's was where it's hit, and so it's like I had no idea that there were buffalo anywhere around there, but it's just like, oh, that's such a strange coincidence. That yeah. Flint Hills, it's like a rich, you know, landscape with, you know, surviving prairie, so. Yeah, it's kind of accidental because the Flint Hills are too rocky to farm. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so, shout out to the rocks for making, for preserving that, that bit of prairie. Yeah, but it's amazing to go, um, it's amazing to go there. I mean, like I said, there's only 4% of tall grass prairie ecosystem that remains. So yeah, if you ever get a chance, the tall grass prairie national preserve is incredible. And there's a small bison herd there. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. If folks were interested in